Welcome. I'm Lena Tabori, co-founder and publisher of the website climatechangeresources.org, a massive informational site dedicated to two things. One, curating resources on climate change, which explore the ways in which climate change intersects with our lives through our economics, our health, our security, and our politics, just to name four of the close to 300 subjects covered. And two, providing intelligent suggestions for taking action. Whether you're a child, a parent, an individual, a business, or a municipality. I created this site with my partner, Mike Shatskin, shortly after Trump was elected. We'd both spent our life in publishing. He is a consultant. I as a publisher at three separate companies, two of which I founded. We both embrace truth. We're passionate about delivering it in an accessible way. The site is by no means climate change for dummies, but it is clear, direct, and understandable to anyone curious enough to spend time there. People visit for different reasons. Some worry about polar bears or coral reefs. Others are concerned about wildfires, drought, and hurricanes. Some wonder if their health issues are related to global warming. Others come to learn how to talk to family and friends who are in denial. And some come knowing that they wanna do something. They're looking to arm themselves with a direction, some knowledge and ideas of how to go forward. One thing they recognize is the power of politics in making needed changes. Um, as an executive board member with the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents, it's my honor to begin a series of conversations exploring those intersections between climate change and our lives. The first conversation concerns climate policy and politics in the Biden age. Joel Stromberg is my guest. He's an attorney with deep experience in federal and state energy, environmental and sustainable issues, and has spent 40 years as a clean energy and climate advocate. He worked as a special counsel at the US Department of Energy at the under and assistant secretarial levels. He also happens now to be a reporter whose beat is climate change, politics, and the law. I came to know him first through reading his blogs on civil notion, which now appear, it seems, everywhere on Medium, on Resilience, Energy Voices, Aluminum, and Renewable Energy News, not to mention our own Climate Change Resources website. He is that brilliant journalist who reports, dissects, analyzes, and synthesizes so seamlessly, you come to believe that he must know all the players personally and be privy to all their thoughts and intentions from Trump to Biden, Pelosi and Schumer to McConnell, and God forbid, Manchin. It has become increasingly clear that we are struggling as a nation and perhaps even as a world to come together to solve the greatest existential threat we've ever faced. Perhaps we're just not good at dealing with existential threats that could be. It's my hope that in this conversation, Joel can help us understand how political action, political impasse and political will will play a critical role in moving us forward. At this moment in time, The Biden administration has been in office for less than a year. Maybe we can start with what you think he arrived with, and then maybe you can talk a little bit about what he inherited from the previous administration, Joel. You're mute, my darling. Yeah, here we go. Um, thanks for inviting me, uh, Lena, and I'll do my best, obviously, to. Uh, try to explain things. I think I'm gonna have a tough time meeting, uh, meeting that, that, that introduction, however. So um, <laughs> we'll, see what, we'll see where it takes us. Um, what Biden, Biden came into office as the first president um, in the last 50 years that actually has a good understanding of what climate change does and what you need to do to combat it. Um, he's walked in with, a, with an all of government approach. And, and that I think is, is extremely important um, in its own right. I mean, he's helped, he's helped us to understand the, the, the scope and the, and the breadth of what the issue is. Doing something about it, obviously, is, is another issue. But um, I think the other irony that he came in with is that 
he is probably the most middle of the road politician any of us have, have seen, at least in the last 30 years, right? And now what he's done is he's adopted the most progressive um, climate uh, platform of any president. So that he's, like I said, he's, maybe he's the perfect messenger of being able to take what the progressives had to say, you know, in terms of the Green New Deal, and then be able to package and um, reconfigure it as actual policy where, where things get done. Um, he's come in with a lot of problems. So, I mean, Trump, for example, in his four years in, in the Oval Office, he gutted federal agencies. I mean, people either, the, the best people either um, easily, either quit or they took um, assignments someplace else. The ones that stayed that were, you know, that are true to their jobs probably didn't help him any. But what's happening now is that Biden has all these things he wants to get done. And, you know, bureaucracies love, or, love them or hate them. They're needed. I mean, he, he can't do the implementing. He can only do set the tone, so to speak. Um, there's also something, you know, the specter of Biden only being four years in office is also going to prove difficult for him, I think, to, to attract the really bright and committed career people. Um, you know, people are saying, well, if, if, if Trump gets back in, we're back in the same position. For that matter, I think that, that leaders in the EU and, and around the world, you know, who look, who look at Biden and say, well, you know, that's a lot better than Trump, also understand that Biden doesn't have the, the political clout. Um, it's just too narrow uh, uh, a democratic majority in Congress to be able to get things done. And that's something that we've seen, you know, over the last few weeks, you know, when one senator basically um, can, in fact, dictate what it is that national policy is, is, is about. Um, the other thing I think we have to understand about the change that Biden is offering can't really be immediate. He's he's faced uh, he's faced with undoing in part what what Trump has done um, and then redoing it and generally that is done by regulation and so regulations that are that are actually drafted today may not actually be implemented before the end of his first term um, just to give you an idea of the magnitude he's already um, his administration has already begun to write thirty five regulations of their own. Um, 76 of Trump's rules have been overturned, but now there, there, there are holes where that, where that was. Um, 93 in total have been tar targeted, 93 climate-related regulations. And that can go from anything of how do you, uh, how do you um, account for the social price, for example, of carbon. Um, it, it could include purchasing power, uh, what kind of contracting can be done. I mean, there's, there's a lot of it here. Um, and it gets very detailed and detailed in the sense that if you don't have, you know, the, the science to back it up, then you don't really have the, you know, the job of writing it. The other thing that happens is that we're going to see, just as we always have, that whatever Biden does is going to be challenged in the courts. So that's something that, that's going to, it's really going to put the mark on his administration. Again, anything that's written today um, will be lucky to get out um, by the end of this term. A lot of this has to do with just administrative procedures. Every major rule has to go through this kind of this 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 gauntlet um, where you have to you have to account for the environmental impacts. You have to open it up to public um, from public input, and so that you have uh, you know testimony throughout the country. This can take an incredibly long time. Um, the best example of this I can suggest is EPA's authority to regulate greenhouse gases um, was established by a legal case, Massachusetts versus EPA. Um, at the time, Bush was uh, Bush uh, Jr. was in the White House. Okay, so that decision came down in 2007. In 2015, the Obama administration came out with a rule based on that. That was the Clean Power Plan. That rule has never gone into effect. Um, and although it's been rescinded by, by Trump, um, there's still a hole here. So we don't know exactly how the United States is gonna actually meet these kind of, uh, the, these aggressive uh, climate goals of the administration.
Um, this, I mean, this is, it'll be, by the time this is through, I don't think we're going to have a rule in place on um, power, power generating stations as far as emissions are concerned. Uh, that one will be really lucky if we get by the end of, of four years. Um, so, I think. Joel, so what I'm understanding is that he, he inherited a batch of things from Trump that he had to roll back. He's also inherited a damaged bureaucracy that has to be repaired in order for implementation to take place. He's also repaired, he's also inherited inherent delays in the way things are able to move forward. What is US climate policy today um, as a result of all of this? And, and what were the achievements of the infrastructure bill, which he did manage to pass um, and perhaps that can sort of lead us into the discussion of the Build Back Better bill. Um, policy today is 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 in 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 limbo, if you will. I mean, we we do have the Clean Air Act, we have the Clean Water Act, we have all the basic um, legislation that you know has led to regulation over the last fifty years, actually. Um, but this on again, off again, most of what. Biden has been able to accomplish so far has been via executive order. Now, an executive order has a standing of law as long as the, the, the order is on the book, okay? And usually the, the order stays on the book as long as the president stays in office. I mean, the first thing that, that Obama did when he got into office was to rescind um, Bush's environmental uh, regulations that you know supported fossil fuels. Um, then Trump comes in, and the first thing he does is he tears up all of Obama's. Um, and then Biden came in, and he promised in the first day that he was going to do it, and he tore up all of Trump's. So what happens is you have this kind of uh, frenetic activity that that takes away things but doesn't put them back in. Um, in in a sense, the the what Biden can accomplish at the moment anyway, is through the budgeting process of the Department of Energy and, and uh, the Department of Transportation and the various agencies. But we're, we're, we're lacking the kind of aggressive regulations that are needed to meet uh, Biden's goals of, of a, an economy that's a net zero by uh, emitter by 2050 and 80% he wants to do by 2035. Those are massive step ups especially when you don't have the rules in place that allow that to happen. Now, one of the things that I think is, is where current policy is, um, is in two areas. One is policy is personnel. Biden has brought in some really good people I and mean, people that were experienced um, in government work. So that helps. But, you know, they're at the top layer. Hopefully that'll encourage some other you know, new hires and what have you to come into um, to force during his four years. The other thing is using the government as purchaser. I mean, that was the, this is the other thing I think that, that, that can happen and not be a case of where the Republicans start attacking the Democrats. The, they have a massive amount of buying power, you know, the, the federal government. In the infrastructure bill um, and in what was left of the bill, Build Back Better, those numbers could have gone up significantly. Now, one of the things that he's done in the infrastructure bill is that there are monies available to put in 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations, which sounds like a lot, certainly. But the fact of the matter is that California alone, to meet the, the, the coming uh, number of electric vehicles that will be on the road, will need a million and a half um, chargers for the state only, not for the country. So that this helps to build things out, but it doesn't build them out. Again, we're getting, I mean, he's, he's, he's good about getting his people together and getting the agencies moving, moving at least in one direction, and that becomes important. Um, budgeting obviously becomes a problem, but we don't know where that's gonna end up. The, the Congress is working at the moment actually in a, in a bipartisan way to avoid another government shutdown. The, the federal budget comes up again. Um, the resolution is keeping us funded comes up again on February 18th. And so they're, what they're trying to do is to at least get back by that hurdle. The problem is that you can't with 
with existing funds and ex existing um, instructions to use that money as you will for these new programs. So the, you know, this is gonna be a dynamic that we're gonna have to fight about. So, okay, so we've got the infrastructure bill passed and you're gonna talk to us a little bit at some point about what we can achieve there outside of, of course, the charging stations. But then there's the Build Back Better. That's like part of, part of when you're talking about US policy today, that has been defeated and Manchin is the one who has basically stood in the way of it. He's decided to take the fall for the fossil fuel industry, I think um and and or not the fall as it turns out he's sort of become appointed king of the united states as a result of it all um but can you just start to sort of talk a little bit about i, I love this photograph of I was saying, yeah you know i think i've mentioned to you before i think it's a perfect meme about where is climate policy today in the united states yeah, I mean, this looks like the photograph in uh, in Michigan when Biden uh, visited there, talking about it. it is actually, it's, yes, a, right. it's a, yeah, it's the it's the Frick Forest is what it's okay. called. So this is a good example of why we need an infrastructure bill. <laughs> but, but anyway, so I just move forward a little bit on on um, on you know what we're going to do if we can't. Or what we're going to do, period. I, mean, I guess no, without no. new. I mean, obviously, you're saying that without new legislation, we're just going to be on again, off again, in this you know cycle of executive no, orders, right. going to go back and forth and back and forth. But, but you know what? What else? I mean, what, for example, else could happen? You've got a note here on the Supreme Court. You know, right? There, yeah. Let, let's back up for just one second. I mean, I think that a couple of things are going on here. Number one. <laughs> The infrastructure bill was passed as a bipartisan measure. I would be careful about giving Biden too much credit for having that happen. Um, it's actually one of the things that Manson was able to accomplish with Republican support um, in, in the Senate. And one of the things that's being talked about constantly in Washington these days is just how effective is Biden being as a as a as a a, a deal maker, if you will. You know, he came in saying that I can, you know, I can bridge the divide. Well, I don't think that he can. I don't know that anybody can, if you want to know the truth. And one of the things that I think that, that, that we're seeing in, in Biden's case, and not to take away anything from his, his years of service to the United States, is I don't think he sees, he sees a world that's not there anymore. I mean, you know, it, it's always, everything is back in the day. Um, and so, so a couple of opportunities for bipartisanship have been arising. The infrastructure bill is one of them. There's a new bill that was just passed uh, this morning in the House um, that, in fact, includes pieces um, of climate policy that are really important. Um, and I, and the, the bill that passed today, for example, is, is really about foreign trade. And it's written as a challenge to China um, and it's, it's, it's influence, rising influence um, in the energy world and, and what have you, and as far as semiconductors. And so one of the areas that we're gonna see supported, I think in the next year or so, is creating more opportunities for the rise of a domestic industry and in, in, um, uh, in cells, you know, in, um, in, in computer, cell, uh, computer chips, um, in manufacturing. In fact, the bill that passed today in the House had a lot of money and it has some $600 billion a year um, for development of an internal uh, solar industry that um, you know, is built up through tax credits and what have you. The odd thing there was that the Repu every Republican in the, in the Senate, with the exception of one, Kinzinger, who's not running for re-election as a Republican, voted against the bill. And yet that bill um, not only was sent over from the Senate with a, with a big bi bipartisan push, uh, 68 senators in total voted for it. Um, and this is, a, this is something that should be bread and butter for the Republicans. And yet here they are in the House saying, well, we're going to vote against the bill. Now, it passed. 
Um, and it goes over to the Senate now for uh, for additional conferencing. They're going to work out the differences. And the solar stuff in the House is not in the Senate bill, but it probably will end up being there. So that's Wait, one area. Wait, one second. So it's passed in the Senate in one form. It's passed in the House in a slightly different form. Right. And now the two th the two forms have to be reconciled. Will they be voted on again in the Senate and the House? Yes, or they, they, they yeah, the, the conference. Or yes, does the conference I, or or when they when they conference together, does that resolve it? Yes, they resolve the differences. The um, a, there's a lot of commonality there. The the solar provisions, for example, are not in the Senate version, um, and that is going to get developed along the way. And it, it's done for reasons. And one of the reasons that they're able to to even think about this piece of legislation. Um, the Compete Act, I think is what it's called, um, is because there, there are enough Republicans in the Senate to let that come to the floor for a vote. What happens, the, all the flap that's been going on about the filibuster, the filibuster rule says that you can't shut off debate without having 60 uh, votes for it. And with you know, the Democrats, 50 votes, they need 10 more. So this is something that can be brought to the floor because a lot of things that'll be brought to the floor um, can in fact be accepted once once the light is on them, if you will. This is not true of most legislation that's going on now about, about energy and environment. So this is one of those unique areas, um, along with the use of purchasing power that's kind of hidden in there, uh, in, in people's budgets and stuff. Um, and so there, there are bits and pieces coming so on. What, and What is potentially the timing now? So these two bills have passed in the, in, both in Senate and in House. They're now conferencing to pull them together. What is the next step? What what happens next, and how long does it take generally? Uh, uh, hard to know. Okay. Um, first of all, they're going to have to they have they're going to have to appoint uh, each the Democrats and Republicans each uh, throw their own negotiators into it, um, and so we'll know that schedule fairly soon. I think it'll happen fairly quickly, at least if the Democrats have their way, because Biden would certainly like to have something to uh, to talk about during his State of the Union on March 1st. I think it's something of an, an ambitious cycle, but it's possible. Um, it's, the, the arguments are going to be over the provisions that the House progressives put in that the Senate didn't have in because the bill was more, more moderate oriented. Okay, so does this is this a good moment just for you to share with us the way the budget process works or shall we just skip forward? No, no, I, I think that's important. You know, I mean, it's it's the details of government really are important. And we can get to that in a second. You know, the normal budgeting process, as you see on the slide, is the budget committee in the Senate and the House decide how much they intend to to have the the government spend okay so they put this resolution together and there are divisions out by programs but but you don't have to hold to them this is kind of a uh, you know let's begin the negotiating sort of thing then the appropriations should come up and that has to happen in the house because the constitution says that all tax bills have to be in the in the people's houses as opposed to the upper chamber which tends to be more elite um and there are 12 subcommittees that will be talking about the individual projects, programs, department agencies, what have you, so 12 of them. And the subcommittees will then bring their um, re recommendations up through the process. Um, presumably it gets voted on the way the, you know, the way it comes up through the 12 subcommittees and have you. And then the government is then Congress authorizes agencies to spend the money that's been given to them. Um, this hasn't happened very often in the last 18 years. In fact, in the last over the last 18 years, 10 of them have meant have seen that the federal government has no actual appropriations or budget or authorization. They operate on a continuing resolution. It's a stopgap measure. It was never intended to be the way the the Congress you know comes uh, comes about uh, raising and spending revenues. But there's such gridlock 
that it's, it just hasn't happened. Now, what, what people will see in the next week or so is that the United States has to come once again, or the Congress has once again, is going to come up with a continuing resolution. They're promising that it'll be a short term resolution and that they will actually go back to the normal order of business. But that has not been the way of the last 18 years and a limiting factor in just re-upping the same budget over and over again is it doesn't allow for new projects. You don't have the authorization, you don't have the appropriation. The continuing resolution says you spend what you have the way you did it yesterday. Oh boy. Okay, so that takes us back to how we end up actually paying for the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and, and what it contained that had to do with climate, basically. Can you focus on that for a bit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and what we what we're the infrastructure bill, for example, is that's an authorizing bill. It's not an appropriation. Okay. Right, so, right. so they've gotten, you know, got this bill and now they have to bring the money into it so that it, it corresponds to what it is that the infrastructure bill is doing. Um, and that's gonna be the work too of time. I mean, it was what what happens with that money once it gets there, assuming that they pass the 18 or the, yeah, the, you know, the budget in normal, the appropriations in the next normal course is that these funds will now be available for whatever the programs are. Um, and, and they're important programs. I mean, we, we see in this list that money is being given to harden the grid off. I mean, something that has always been a problem and is spoken of as a problem because to get these new power systems in and what have you, you need a, you need a grid that's different. We saw that in Texas, for example. Okay. Um, the rail is is important. That was the rail n number is, is is Biden's. It's kind of an homage to Biden because he you know he took the train between um, his home and Congress every day for for decades. Um, the we're beginning to see in this kind of a process also some of the some of the the priorities that are being put on it, and so uh, by the Democrats. I mean, so for example, in the in the infrastructure bill, not only do you get uh, charging stations, what you get is you get opportunities for rural America to become part of that, both through you know computer, being just expanding broadband, um, and they're looking for ways to be able to bring the rural the rural population in with the urban population, so that that everybody's kind of speaking off the same uh, song sheet. the The problem has been Republicans have traditionally said. You know, this is an urban thing. I mean, and, and they talking about urban liberals and what have you. And their constituents are rural, which is true. Um, and so I think that this is an area that the Democrats are going to have to step out on is to be able to provide more opportunities for rural America. Um, there are other issues that surprisingly aren't as much in, in, in view in this as, they, as you might have imagined. You know, Biden promised to do 40% of his programming had to do with environmental justice. Uh, well, 40% of his programming is not showing up in these bills quite like that. Um, and, you know, I think that, that, that there's going to have to be some kind of reconfiguring uh, some of these things. Can we go to the next slide? I think, Lena, you know, we've got another. Wait, yeah. Yeah, let me, oops, okay, good. Um, okay. Um, in the bill, I mean, there, there, are, there are things being put out for environmental justice. For example, the low-income home weatherization programs. Um, there are other, uh, the weatherization is, the, what they're doing is the federal government is gonna pay to have um, residences insulated and to be made obviously um, more immune to the cold than they are in, in low income uh, neighborhoods. But you know, the other thing is we talked about the infrastructure and literally the infrastructure bill, it doesn't have as much uh, in it to stop pollution. What it does is it's, it's basically an investment in adaptation and resilience. And I think this is an issue that we're gonna have to look at a lot because this is where we're at a point, for example, where uh, we know that the trouble is coming. Communities are saying the trouble is coming and the Republicans and Democrats are both gonna be more supportive of hardening those communities off. But I wonder if that's just not waving a flag of defeat and saying, you know, all right, we can't do anything about it. We'll just, we'll just make ourselves more protected from what's, 
from what's about to happen. Um, the infrastructure bill has not been given any kind of a, a grade as far as stopping emissions. I mean, all of this in here is not about stopping emissions as much as it is adaptation, resilience, and the transition to a certain extent. But you can't qualify this the way, for example, we could have in the Build Back Better Act, especially in the provision that was knocked out of it before it even made it into the bill for the clean electric standard, the national clean electric standard. Um, and that, that, that alone was going to be able to really get us very, very close to what it is that, that Biden says we need, what it is that he's promised, what other nations believe is necessary as well. And, and now we're back to kind of this piecemeal uh, uh, approach to, to policymaking. Okay, so what you're describing for the infrastructure bill is that we are dealing with adapting to the conditions which we know are only going to get worse instead of actually mitigating um, the climate change problems, which will ultimately avoid the adaptation issues, which we're now going to be spending money on. So let's just go forward and talk a little bit about, you know, obviously the Build Back Better bill is is suffering and may never even find a way to emerge in chunks or not chunks. But one of the ways in which you had thought and everybody had thought that it would find a way to get resolved was through budget reconciliation, which is a completely different form of passing the bill than, than what the infrastructure bill, how the infrastructure bill was moved forward. I, I wonder if it isn't useful just for people to understand uh, what the details of a budget reconciliation bill is and 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 why we thought that might work. I, I recognize that Manchin has completely thrown a wrench into that, but what did we think was going to work and, and how well, and, and what are the regulations around it? What we were hoping to have happen was to um, immunize the, 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 the work of the Build Back Better Act from the filibuster in the Senate. Okay, the House doesn't have a filibuster, doesn't have the same filibuster rule. So in the Senate, you have to have 60 votes to stop the debate on anything. A filibuster is nothing more than endless talk. Um, and I mean, that literally, that's what it is. Um, in the old day, back in the day, you somebody had to actually stand in the well of the Senate to keep talking. Now they just kind of raise their hand and say, well, we're gonna filibuster this. And everybody says, oh my God, um, and so nothing ever, ever, ever happens. So what the filibuster has done is to keep the Build Back Better Act from ever coming to the floor for a vote or anything else in the Build Back Better Act for that matter. Um, and the reason it was packed is because you only get so many bites of the apple every year. I mean, the, the reconciliation package. Um, and that was the one. And so they put all these things in, some, some climate, some not, because it, it, it meant that they didn't, you don't fill, you can't filibuster a reconciliation bill. Okay, I mean, it's just the way the rule is written. Um, but the other thing that you can't do with the reconciliation bill is you can't actually do things that are not involving the budget outlay and taxes. Um, and so we saw, for example, in the clean energy standard, in the clean electric standard, um, that this was, you know, this would have been all right in the bill, but they did it in an odd sort of way. What they were going to do is they were going to pay utilities for being, for, for the transition to, to renewables, okay? And then they were going to penalize the ones that didn't do that. So that's a fiscal matter, right? But the thing is that if they couldn't, for example, fund the clean power plan, which is just pure regulation in that kind of a bill. Well, what's happened now with the bill is that there, we've started a new session. So we have one more shot this year at the reconciliation package. And you know, when you have one wish, you have to kind of think of it, you know, what do I really want to wish for? So what they've tried to do with, with the Competes Act is to, that's something that can actually make it through the normal order. The reconciliation bill the next time around I don't know exactly what they're going to have included in that. It's going to be a same sort of a jumble. Um, and so what they're looking at now, Manchin has indicated that he was willing to support a lot of the energy and environmental provisions in the build back, in the reconciliation package, okay? But he was against several of the things, including an extension of a child, uh, child care uh, tax credit. 
And so that just got stopped. And then, you know, like I said, this new session, uh, a new approach. If they can fashion a bill to Manson's liking, um, they might be able to get that through the Senate. They might not. I mean, this is one of those things I think they're going to negotiate as much as they can. And then ultimately, they're going to decide, you know, does it go to the reconciliation package? Can we lower some of the problems by taking some of that out? Uh, one of the things that I think that is likely to happen, um, uh, one that I'm actually quite sure will happen, is that the tax credit provisions of the Build Back Better Act, uh, it's about th there was about $300 billion of the $550 billion total in the, in, uh, the Build Back Better Act. I think that's going to get, ex those will be passed. I think that we'll see, you know, solar and wind and, and um, biomass and, and uh, carbon sequestration. Those are going to make it into whatever this next bill is going to be. What you try to do is to tie that bill to something that everybody wants. That was the, the original, it's, it's why the, the progressives were opposed to splitting the infrastructure and the build back better. They knew that the infrastructure was, was a piece of legislation that every legislator would have tough time voting against. Well, if you attached something that was unpopular, then maybe you could sneak it through. It's just not true anymore. So now we have, we've got this, this all unwinding and we're gonna either be looking at um, a series of, of energy environmental bills that take care of tax credits and what have you. And then whatever's left over, they'll try to put in the reconciliation package. Again, the, the ultimate arbiter of what goes in and what doesn't go into a, uh, a budget reconciliation is a parliamentarian in the Senate. It's a, she is a neutral and um, she's she's already kicked out in the, in the previous session, for example, the immigration um, policies and programs that, that the Democrats wanted to put into force. She said that it just wasn't it was not germane to the reconciliation. It didn't the follow vote, the rules. Voting, voting Act also she kicked out, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. And um, okay. and again, that's a perfect example of pure policy having no real impact, fiscal impact. Right. So, so just quickly to just to recap, the reconciliation bill they can do one per session. That's the way the the rules are. Uh, yes. The parliamentarian is the one who decides ultimately what can and cannot be in that bill, and it has to basically be fiscally motivated. What is in that right. bill? The reconciliation bill uh, works if fifty, because we have a hundred senators. If fifty of them vote for it, and um, and Harris as our vice president uh, throws her vote for it, then we've got 51 and it passes. Other, otherwise, it's going, to be, um, it's going to be challenged by the filibuster and the- Yeah, exactly. that's exactly right. That's pretty enough. much what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's, it's complicated to understand all the ways in which government works, but this is, this is it. So the, I'm just gonna show quickly the slide that you so brilliantly put together just watching the way in which this incredible process starts and finishes it's kind of ruled goldberg oh rule, my god rule Golden, yeah yeah and i mean and the craziness of course in listening to you talk about it is you know even after we've got a bill passed like for example the infrastructure bill we still have to have um we still have to have it still has to move into you know implementation which requires right. authorization and 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 money so so here are the Here's just your slide on the climate related provisions that were in the budget reconciliation bill. I don't know that you want to talk about these, but. Well, I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, I think that, already. right. I mean, of these, I think that, you know, that what, again, tax credits should, yeah. should have. Um, the other thing to look for in this is that um, Manson is going to trade. He's just not going to say, oh, goody, you know, the progressives want this. I'll put this in a separate bill. He wants things too. And, and his, his, He's had problems from the beginning as far as some of the, the substance of the of the bill is about. Uh, one of them, for example, is he doesn't want utilities and um, oil and gas companies fined for methane emissions. Um, and you know, this is why not? Uh, why don't you charge somebody that causes the harm? Now he's a he's he's from a fossil fuel state. Although I think, to be honest with you, I think he's more he's more consistent to his own his own pocketbook as far as coal is concerned. I mean, he, he gets a lot of money from, from uh, 
coal coal mines. It's estimated that he gets a half a million dollars a year um, just by what's already in place for him through you know through the uh, private practice that he had. Um, but so so here is going to be. Oh, great. That's um, I think the civilian climate court is something that I find very interesting. I don't know that it'll ever come into be, um, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, excitement about that, that 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 may or may not like I said, result in, in the bill itself. Um, the growing domestic supply chain, in a sense, they've partially taken care of this. Um, in the competes act, if if the house provisions stay in it, uh, electric bikes. I don't know. Um, there's going to be another fight over this as well, and that the the tax credit for electric vehicles um, should be remain in the bill. The Biden administration decided they wanted to add money um, if the cars were built in the United States by union labor, um, and that's something the Republicans are just not going to. They're not going to sit still for it. It's it's an important provision for Biden and the Democrats because their appeal to labor is not what it used to be. I mean, I remember growing up that that you know when when the presidents of the labor union spoke, everybody did what they what what they were told to do. Uh, same was true of politicians as well. And now, as a friend of mine says, it's like herding cats. I mean, they just don't they just don't stay in order very long. Um, but I do think that, like I said, I think of the 550 million total, billion total, I think that they'll be able to, to get uh, the 300, 350, maybe 400 billion. Um, we'll see what happens as far as, as negotiations are, are concerned. And um, now, uh, again, there are these other pieces of legislation, for example, the Competes Act, some of the money that the House put back in was a lot of money. It was, it was it was back to the global green fund that the United States has not been contributing to, um, and that made it into the House version. Hopefully, they'll be able to negotiate that in the in the Senate version as well. But I think as far as as a discrete piece of legislation, we're looking at um, tax credits, some of these other things, estimate three hundred and fifty billion a year, and then we'll see where we go. Part of it's going to depend on whether Manson, you know, Manson has this in his head that. Everything has to be paid for 10 years out. It's kind of an odd quirk. Um, the census has a lot to do with, with his thinking on this. Um, and you know, initially what, what the Democrats tried to do was to say, well, look, it, we'll fund it for two years and then we'll see what happens. I mean, and Manson understands that, uh, everybody in town understands actually that if you, if you, short, if you short change something that's popular, once it's, once it's going on, getting rid of anything these days in a government period is just impossible. I mean, we, we keep building these silos. You know, if, if fossil fuels are still good and to be supported, then you do solar, but you don't undo the fossil. And this is where, we're, you know, the, the, real, the real crunch is going to come at a time when you cannot afford environmentally or any other way to have fossil fuels supported at, at the level they are and still try to go to become, you know, a zero net emitter. That just isn't going to happen. Um, we'll also see a lot of investments in carbon capture and sequestration. Another thing that, that Biden or that Manson is going to is going to hold hard on is, you know, is, is that sort of thing. Um, how that works around, I, I'm not sure. Is on the methane emissions, for example, the Democrats were saying, okay, we're going to charge the companies on this side, but we have grant money over here that can help them meet that. Why are we paying twice then for, for these emissions? And so we, we, I said, we get this very strange kind of interplay of, of, of pieces and we still don't know what it is that we're trying to achieve. I, you know, I've used before the image of trying to put a, a, a jigsaw puzzle together where all the pieces are white. I mean, it's, you know, how do you do that? I mean, where do you start there? And it's the same thing here that we're going to be getting bits and bobs of things that on their own would be okay, but don't really focus themselves and other resources on those, those spots that have to be, have to be dealt with. We cannot have a national policy to be effective when you have 
you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit of the Defense Department, a little bit of EPA, a little bit of transportation. We, we have no plan. We've never had a plan in the United States, which, which again was the reason that I look back to, um, to Biden and say, well, that's, that is actually something he's brought into office with him that was really needed, is to somebody to talk about these things yeah, with a vision. the scope. Yeah, a vision. And then there's the judicial part of things. Oh, boy, that's, this is the one that, you know, I don't shake in my boots very often, but this, this case is the one that I, that, that I and I'm sure others are worried about. We don't write about it as much as we probably should. What this, what this case does, it's, um, it's West Virginia and there are a whole host of, of red states that have gone in with this. Um, the uh, coal industry is also um, part of, the, of these proceedings. This is the same question that was answered by the Supreme Court in 2007 in the decision in Massachusetts uh, versus EPA. This was a case again that, that allowed, that interpreted the Clean Air Act to include the regulatory authority of EPA on greenhouse gases once they made a determination um, that it was in fact harmful. Okay, so that, that happened. I mean, you know, this is, this is, where are we, 15 years later? This is the same question that's being bridged and it's an entirely different Supreme Court. The 2007 court um, was, the, the split was five to four. Um, and Scalia wrote the, the dissenting opinion. Um, the question before the court now is again, does EPA have the authority to regulate greenhouse gases? We know they're harmful, but, but if they don't have the regu- you know, if they don't have the authority, then what are you going to do about it? We've got in the six conservatives, I think there are at least two justices that are more than willing to just quickly overturn that they don't believe in precedent. Um, for example, uh, uh, Amy Cono, uh, uh, Connor Barrett um, was asked a question during her uh, her hearings, um, confirmation hearings. Did she consider Brown v. Board, which is the case that, that basically led to desegregation of U.S. schools? Does she think that settled law? The phrase "settled law" is, do you, you know, will you follow precedent on this? She didn't answer that question, um, and we've seen a couple of times already where this Supreme Court, as 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 short a period as they've been in, you know, uh, in session appears to be willing to overturn in one fell swoop cases that have had that other cases have been you know decided on for for years now if they do that what's the option okay i mean where who regulates then well the answer to that is the answer i think to all of this you know that um it needs legislation it needs specific legislation it needs legislation that says epa has the authority to regulate greenhouse gases. I don't know how you get that. To be honest with you, I mean, if the way, if, if the Supreme Court overturns Massachusetts, I don't know where we are. I mean, the federal government is not gonna be allowed to regulate until something specific in a law says that they can. And this, you know, this, this is the difference between textualists um, and, and liberals, as far as the, the, the justice system is concerned. Liberals look at, the, look at the Constitution, they look at laws, and they try to do things consistent with the spirit, if not exactly the letter, okay? For textualists, there is no spirit. I mean, there, there's only the word. And if the word isn't there, well, too bad. Um, you'll just have to go out and do what you need to do, put the word there. And I, like I said, I, I have no idea how this is going to turn out. I know lawyers who are worried, I mean, who usually aren't worried, um, will know more in, at the end of this month. Uh, oral arguments on that come up on February 28th. We could probably see a decision. Uh, I doubt that it's going to be much earlier than, than, than May, for example. Um, and then we'll just have to see what happens. The only thing we'll be able to do is to guess on the basis of the questions that justice asked during the, the, yes. the case, um, whether they are leading one way or the other. Yep. 
Yep, I see a brilliant blog from you on this coming up. <laughs> you know, so you're making it that, hard to be me. You know that, don't you? Yeah, I, well, you know, the thing is, it's all such an unbelievable muddle. Um, you know, between the process, the, the ability to implement, the inability to pass the laws in the first place, I, I just feel like we're so deadlocked on so many levels and, and, the, and, the, and the challenges seem to be growing, not diminishing. So what's our, what's our, what's, what do you think the bottom line is here? Well, I mean, you know, I'll tell you the same thing I've, I've, I've told clients. I mean, what's your option? I mean, what are you going to do? Stop doing it? And and the and the fact of the matter yeah, is that right. none of this has yeah. ever been quite as clean as we would all like to see it. I mean, the the, the problem with Lita is a, is the problem with everything else in this nation on every law on every issue is hyper partisanship. I mean, I have never said I've been in this town fifty years. Okay, um, and one of the ways you know I you know you you've accused me of actually knowing what was going on. Well, I've seen it happen enough times that. You know, I've got some kind of a commitment to, well, if it happened that way five times, I'm going to guess it's going to do it again. I don't know. I don't even know how to handicap this. I mean, the Republicans who we know are in agreement with this keep their mouths shut. You had asked me uh, a couple of days ago whether or not we thought I thought that that a bill like Build Back Better could be could be put out there and Republicans, you know, would at least give us enough votes to be able to pass it. That's just not going to happen. And it's, I guess it's out of fear. I mean, the, the, the vengeful political uh, environment is just beyond anything. I mean, we're, we're not talking about substantive matters. I mean, we're, we're talking about if the, if the Democrats want it, then the Republicans are going to vote against. It. We saw that in the House just in the vote today. I mean, I know that there are members in the House that are basically in favor of that bill because it creates uh, a domestic manufacturing I industry of uh, you know of computer chips and um, of being able to kind of create what we've been importing here in the United States it makes a lot of sense, and yet they vote against it. I mean, and they will take it. They will take credit for it when it right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this passes. is right. I mean, you know, I mean, that, for, that's, the, that's the other thing that makes me crazy half the time. So, okay. Well, and for so, four years, I mean, Trump took credit for lower emissions, and those were the result of Obama's rules. Yeah, exactly. So, so okay, so let's look at our story. What do you think 2022? I mean, I guess we sort of already know, but, but, but give us your projections. Okay, my projection is that, <laughs> my projection is that a lot's going to depend on the, uh, uh, on the midterm elections. I mean, I think that a couple of things that we should be doing, I know that I'm going to be looking at, I would encourage other, you know, uh, reporters and correspondents to do the same. A lot of this action is now going to move to the state because of the, of the difficulty in getting anything done in the federal government. That too is a problem since 23 states are completely in the lock of Republicans. Okay. But I do think that I mean, state States are going to become very important in this. And for a couple of reasons, I would look for a couple of states, for example, to say, I don't want any of the infrastructure money because you're making me pay for things that, you know, help the environment or whatever. So I think that's something we have to look at. The, the court cases clearly are something that we have to look at. And I think that other things that we have to look at, they could be able to get rules written fast enough that they can begin that process sooner rather than later. Um, I think that, you know, in, in, in every case, this all goes back to the foundation of democracy. It comes to people. Um, and I think that, you know, the importance of, to me, of journalists is to be able to present to people what it is they need to know to make a wise decision. And I think that, you know, if we can do that, then sooner or later we'll turn the corner. The problem is that we shouldn't get so hung up on We've got to do this in five years or else. It just, I mean, I'd like to see it happen that way, but it won't. So let's figure out what we want to do um, and then be able to build that from the ground up. I mean, if, if more voters had indicated to members of Congress that they want, you know, these more progressive bills, well, then the Congress would have the problem of having to deal with that. So, I, you know, I think what we have to do is to do what we do all the time. I mean, to, pull our forces together to not let bad things happen, you know, um, if we can avoid it. 
and to keep plugging. Sooner or later, what's going to happen is nature is going to tell us that she is not pleased. Um, and, you know, I hate to say it, but sometimes individuals, people, sometimes nations have to kind of hit bottom before they decide that they need to bounce up. And I don't know where we are in it. I just don't know any other way of going about it. Thank you, Joel Stomberg. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, as it mm. always is. Uh, thank you, Lita. Always a pleasure.